Mohan, can you check whether it is live or not? I am seeing the live. Yeah, uh, yeah, Lakshmi, it is okay. I'll check. It shows the live. Just a minute. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Lakshmi, it's live. Huh? Lakshmi, it is live. Such sir. shall we start? Yeah, I think it would be good. Yeah. So recording is uh, on uh, on process. I think uh, you just give the introduction as uh, like previous time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good afternoon to uh, one and all present here. So on behalf of uh, South Asian Metrological Association and uh, uh, SRA Minister of Science and Technology, so we welcome you uh, for the 11th lecture of the uh, Open Classroom Online Lecture Series in Atmospheric and Climate Sciences. So on, be on this occasion, I welcome the panelists, uh, President uh, Sama Ajit Yagi, sir, Speaker of uh, today's lecture, uh, Dr. B. Mukhopa sir, and my uh, friends, uh, Dr. Swagata, Dr. Mohan, uh, and Dr. Rohini, uh, who are acting as the panelists for today's lecture. And I welcome all the participants who are spending their time attending all these lectures and making this event a grand success. I welcome you all. Now we uh, slightly go to the lecture. So today's lecture will be on the scattering concepts. So I request uh, Dr. Uh, Mukhopadhyay, sir, uh, to proceed for this lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, we start this lecture today, uh, third in the series, as has been told to you. And uh, the, the headings that have gone with the four lectures are actually the keywords, are the most essential keywords. Because when you talk of scattering, it will not be only scattering, but key, uh, scattering would be the highlight of that particular uh, lecture. And uh, I would like to introduce this lecture in a slightly different way. Okay, now, uh, if you permit me, and let me go to the share screen. And Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. No. Full screen mode, sir. Ah, uh, no. What is the uh, key, uh, key for? Uh, F5, 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 F5. 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 Because my uh, panel is hidden. F5. Just one sec. Why is it not coming? One sec. Mm. I think you can see my full screen, which I cannot. I don't know why it is. Mm, no, sir, it is not full screen. I can a little guide about your mouse. I bring it down. Mm -hmm. A more actually. So F five screen. Uh, more, more. Uh, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, I did that. Sir, this one, you just click this one. Now you click F5. Uh, go, come below, sir. Come below. Come below. Okay. Yeah, ma yeah mouse, there is mouse, a mouse. there is a cup. There is a there's a yeah, cup. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that's is hidden, and that's cup. the reason why I was not able to get it. Yeah, and that F5 switch is also not available. F5 key. 
this is completely new thing. Uh, here, F5 is not written. So, F5, I have to count what? Three, four, five. I wouldn't do that because it may. No, sir, you can do that. <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, yeah, I now mean, it came. Now yeah, I got now it. Yeah, now I got it. I'm sorry for the little bit of delay. No, sir, it's okay. Uh, now, uh, what we are now going to do is, uh, we have already done something about uh, the, the emission. And now, that is only one of the three things that we are concerned with uh, in terms of atmospheric radiation. It's, <laughs> I'm sorry. The radiation is emitted. Nevertheless, that is one of the uh, three uh, aspects that we want to see. The other is, as it moves through the medium, it is absorbed. And the third is, that as it moves through the medium, the, it's also scattered. Now, there is a qualitative and quantitative difference in the way these two are, uh, these two are attached, uh, these two are linked. And that's why uh, scattering being a very fancy word, you know, because uh, it involves uh, uh, total anisotropy, uh, very large uh, directional qualities, and that's why uh, as well as it's important uh, in terms of climate, we are uh, now slowly moving into an area where aerosol scattering is being seriously considered in almost all dynamical models. And therefore, these two things, absorption and scattering, along with emission, become the three processes that we need to study. Uh, first of all, absorption leads to attenuation. We, we stress on this. So on the left-hand side, this is the intensity that is entering a medium from zero to L and exiting the medium on the right-hand side. So it's obviously depleted. The radiance that is entering is lambda zero with a subscript and lambda L with this subscript. If we need to integrate it throughout the medium, let's consider an infinitesimal element, ds, a path length ds. And uh, the, the amount of depletion uh, in this small elemental path length is dn. Now, this is a setting uh, with which we would like to write a small equation. Right. <clears throat> this is almost uh, common sense. And uh, what it says is that the fractional depletion, there's a fractional depletion uh, is, obviously it's a depletion, that's why this minus sign is proportional to the length of uh, this path traveled. That is one thing, that is easily understandable. The more is the path length, the more is it. Then the, also the number of absorbing particles that it encounters, which depends upon the density at the point S. So uh, it depends on that as well. And uh, the third is that it is proportional to this. And this proportionality uh, we give with the subscript A. So this is uh, called the spectral absorption coefficient because this is uh, dependent on the wavelength. Now, uh, when it is dependent on the wavelength, we need to write separate equations for all wavelengths. And so when we are integrating over all wavelengths, we need to consider that. The different values of K that we encounter for different wavelengths. So the terms here are spectral absorbance on the left-hand side. And this coefficient is called the spectral absorption coefficient. And so this is very, very easy to understand. It's almost a common sense equation. Now, having said that, uh, let's see how it can vary. Uh, what uh, functionally it can be, like say, density can vary with this. In the atmosphere, it's not equally dense everywhere. And so if whatever situation we are dealing with, uh, we will usually take recourse to the example of the atmosphere. Uh, we know that this is a function of S. The density is a function of S. So that is one notion that is built in. Secondly, this obviously is a function of the kind of molecule that is being encountered, which is participating in absorption. So as long as the atmosphere is uniformly, uh, um, chemically uniform in terms of the number of uh, molecules of each species, we don't expect this to change. 
But if with S, this can also change if the composition of the atmosphere changes. Now, this is the setting of this particular equation. So when you integrate it, we can put all these three inside the integral. We can make an assumption and take this out of the integral. And in very rare cases, we can think of very small parts when we take a row, the density outside the integral. Now, from s equal to 0, you integrate it till the end of the uh, uh, medium to L. So this is obviously uh, at s is equal to L, the n is equal to n lambda, as has been uh, written over here. I have just dropped this subscript L, that's all. And uh, this n lambda L, the emerging uh, radiance, is obviously uh, when you integrate this. Now, when you integrate this, you get the logarithmic function. And so uh, the ultimate solution is e to the power minus, okay? This minus sign comes here. So what it essentially means is that along the path, as you increase s, presuming that the composition of the atmosphere hasn't changed during the s, which is partly true in the troposphere, uh, we can write this uh, equation like uh, in um, the one that is entering, the radius that is entering the medium, and e to the power something. Now, e to the power something with a minus sign is obviously a depletion. That's the measure of the absorption. All right. Now, uh, that's a very simple. I have uh, jumped these steps because when you integrate this, uh, on the left hand side, you have a log function. And then when you write the log function in terms of the uh, natural logarithm, you get this equation. Now, uh, in the most general case, obviously, this would read something like this. This is the most general case, where k also is a function of s. Rho is obviously a function of s. And therefore, we can now define products of these pair, pair at a time, rho into s into ds. Does it have a physical meaning? K into rho into ds, does it have a physical meaning? We would now investigate into this. Now, this is typically uh, and classically known as the, I'm sorry, known as the Beer's law of absorption. Now, this law, when you alter this coefficient and make it more generalized, it need not necessarily be only absorption. Attenuation can be due to other uh, processes also. We can generalize this equation. But the form of this equation like this, in its most general sense, which includes absorption, which may include scattering, but that also can lead to attenuation, uh, is known as the generalized Beer's law. Now, this is a very important law, which talks about attenuation down the path. All right. Now, let's look at these terms. Uh, it's, it, it's very instructive to look at the units of this. Now, the units come from the definitions. So from the first equation that we had written, the definition, uh, that gives the definition, and it gives area per unit mass. If you, if you look back at that uh, equation, you will find that this has the dimensions of area divided by mass. So uh, it's some kind of a cross-section, so to say. Uh, for unit mass. So the mass is uh, uh, more, the cross-section is more. The second is the uh, definition called optical path. But before I go into optical path, let me first tell you what is the geometric path. The geometric path is obviously integral ds, and that is equal to L. So that is the geometric path that the uh, radiation has traveled. Uh, but that does not mean that in terms of Absorption, it should be proportional uh, to that. That's because the composition varies. That's because the density varies. And hence, we have brought in this notion of integral rho s ds uh, from 0 to L. It's called the optical path. That means presuming that the sum total effect of a varying density was to be taken into account, what would be the effective path? That is therefore called optical path. And uh, this and this are bound to have opposite uh, dimensions. Otherwise, the dimensionless quantity on the left-hand side 
wouldn't make sense. So to make the left hand side dn by n, that's a dimensionless quantity. Uh, to make uh, sense out of that, the optical path and the spectral absorption coefficient should have the opposite units, you know, opposite dimensions. Okay, now the third comes this term, this entire term, where you take into account the effect of the molecules also, the, the, the qualitative aspect of each molecule, and its ability to absorb per unit density, okay? Uh, that total integral uh, from zero to L is called as the optical depth, okay? Now, uh, this is just semantics, but nevertheless, uh, they denote different physical quantities. Now, this optical depth by itself doesn't have a unit something like this. this. It is a dimensionless quantity. Uh, why? Because n into this, uh, this ratio is a dimensionless quantity. And hence, e to the power minus t has to be a dimensionless quantity. Okay. So uh, that defines the uh, optical depth. Now, uh, some people, in many cases, especially when drawing analogy with scattering, we come across this product. This product would therefore have a, a, a unit of L to the power minus one, inverse of the uh, length. And uh, this is called as volume absorption coefficient. Similarly, we uh, define a term called volume scattering coefficient, but we will come to that just a little later. Now, uh, <coughs> when we see that these definitions that have been brought in here, uh, they have been brought in with the ultimate, uh, ultimate objective of writing a common equation for both absorption and scattering. And uh, now let's look at this uh, in its integrated forms. And in its integrated forms, if you look at it, I'm sorry. Yeah. What we get here is this uh, term called transmittance. Now, that is for the entire depth. It's not for an incremental uh, uh, depth of the atmosphere. It's for the entire depth. And so in its integral form. So this is this ratio. This ratio is easy to understand that whatever is coming out uh, and whatever had come in. So the ratio of this is what is being transmitted, is a measure of what is being transmitted. So this term is called transmittance. And from this equation that you have seen here, this is equal to e to the power minus tau. Uh, tau is the optical depth. And this transmittance is equal to one minus uh, absorptance. Now, uh, this we have used earlier also in, in, when we were doing a ra radiation budget considerations and greenhouse effect. You remember in the atmosphere, when we treated it as a gray, uh, gray body, uh, then we have used this. So transmittance and absorptance, they, sum tot they add up to give the original energy, that is the one. So transmittance is what is not being absorbed, okay? or absorptance is what is not being transmitted. Now, there is another phenomenon also. There is reflection also. Now, we have to take into account that also. And uh, this n lambda by n, n lambda naught, when it is, uh, this is a small derivation of this. This is obvious, pretty obvious even otherwise. That this can be written as this, this form, the numerator. Uh, n lambda naught minus d n lambda is equal to n, n lambda. Uh, this is nothing but one minus d n by this, which is nothing but one minus abductance. Okay, so it's a small derivation of this. So uh, what we now uh, want to uh, say here by analogy, we can derive this explicitly for R e also, but we now take recourse to analogy and say that. Well, some total of A and R must be something that is not being transmitted. So some total of A and R, if you include, if you write it explicitly, then we can we should write it 1 minus A minus RE, that is reflectance. 
uh, where the medium is reflecting also. So that uh, is the uh, energy conservation equation. A transmittance is equal to one minus of absorptance minus reflectance. You need, in the case of atmosphere, to work out these two, prob these two explicitly and compare it to the transmittance that you're observing, especially satellite measurements, and you can reconcile this. Uh, uh, reconcile this in the sense that there are a lot of things unknown in the atmosphere that are absorbing, a lot of things unknown that are reflecting. And to fine tune this, uh, our knowledge of A and RE, you can make a measurement of TRA uh, using satellites, and you can uh, use that to fine tune the unknown factors in A and R. Now, that is obviously the, the way this science is handled in the case of remote sensing. Okay, now this is something which I want to you to uh, see very intently. And here we are now coming to scattering. When we come to scattering, we had, had absorption. Now when we come to scattering, uh, we know that scattering is a property which is different in different directions. And this is a scattering particle, okay? That small box that you see in the middle is a scattering particle. So the radiation comes and hits it. Okay, fine. So the radiation comes and hits it, scattering in different directions. That is, this direction is very important. This scattering angle is over here. Okay? This scattering angle is over here. This is very important. In different scattering angles, the amount of radiation scattered will be different. But that doesn't happen in the case of absorption. Whichever direction you look at it, the same equation will hold with the same coefficient. Okay, So that is the difference between absorption and scattering. That uh, in the case of absorption, it is uh, isotropic. And we have used this word earlier also, independent of the direction. But in the case of scattering, let us say right in the beginning, uh, and that will help us to formulate, uh, right in the beginning, we would like to say that it is different in different directions. Right. Now, if it is different in directions, then we need to have a geometry. So let this be enclosed by a spherical grid drawn over here, uh, the vertical line over here. Then uh, the path along this is the x-axis. OK? Uh, and this vertical angle of the scattered direction, the vertical angle, and when dropped over here, it has got, a, with respect to the, the, the x-axis, an angle, which is known as the azimuthal angle. Uh, all this is what we have already done, this kind of a r theta phi geometry, it's the polar coordinate geometry. Now, uh, just, for your, just for your information, I tell you how these angles are related, okay? These angles are related through these trigonometric um, uh, relationship, which gives for solid triangles, and uh, no, not triangles on a uh, two-dimensional piece of paper. These are in solid, uh, in three dimensions. So there are some laws which define the addition of angles, uh, which is different from that of plane geometry. Right, but obviously I'm not going to use that in my derivations here because we are going to look at the principles only right now. We would rather try to interpret what we write rather than derive them. That is important. Right, so uh, a beam of light, so to say, in a general way we call it radiation, comes and hits this. This is an elementary um, scatterer with a volume dV. There is this dV with a volume dV. And then instead of going straight, maybe some part of the light goes straight also, some part of the radiation goes straight also, uh, a part of it is scattered away in this particular direction. Okay, It's scattered away in this particular direction. Now let's come to these considerations. A dV is the volume element irradiated with radiation coming from the ith direction. Now it's important to tell the direction. The scattering depends upon which direction the light is coming from and which direction the light is going. And therefore you need to specify. So the ith direction is the incident uh, direction. And also you need to uh, tell that the irradiance in this solid angle omega i, 
That means consider a small cone over here. Okay. Consider a small cone over here. If you have considered a small cone over here uh, with an apex at this particular point. So along that cone with a solid angle, omega i, whatever radiation is coming, that is called Ni. That's the radiance per unit solid angle. Clear? Uh, obviously, it's units. Always look at the units when you get confused with the word, no, with the term. Always look at the units. This is power per unit solid angle. Okay? Power per unit solid angle. So this is bound to be radiance. So Ni is the radiance with which it is impinging on this scatterer, so to say, in a simple way. Now, the irradiance in dV, irradiance in dV will have to be d omega i multiplied by this because n i is nothing but per unit solid angle. So, for a given solid angle, d omega i, for a given elementary solid angle, d omega i, the product of the two is the irradiance in dV from w i or from the direction i, so to say. Uh, please don't get confused with i's and j's. Uh, it's so easy to remember that i is the incident direction. Okay, and s is the scattered direction. The radiant intensity scattered in the sth direction now. Okay, that is this direction that I told you. It could be any other direction as well, but let's take one example. Any other direction, sth direction, um, the direction in the solid angle you consider is omega s. So the radiant density scattered in omega s, okay, in a solid angle in the sth direction. This is equal to, this is written like the, this value, the irradiance uh, at dv, which is over here, the amount of energy incident, multiplied with dv, because dv is the volume. And uh, this is equal to the radiant intensity from i direction to the sf direction. Okay, that means from a solid angle in the ith direction to a solid angle in the sf direction. Why this ith direction and sf direction and solid angles are important is because you are really not interested in finding out which direction, uh, how much is radiation is going, but you're uh, interested in integrating it for all scattering directions. That is your ultimate intention, uh, to integrate it for all scattering intentions. That means we will integrate it for all omega s. Please remember that. And if the radiation is coming from all kinds of directions, we'll have to integrate it for um, uh, i-th direction or, or omega i also. That's why the second differential is used. Uh, for radiant intensity, I've used I here. The second um, uh, differential is used because it is a function of both incoming as well as outgoing solid angles. Yeah. And this is very, very important. This, which is written in bold, is very, very important. Uh, it's a fraction. This radiation that goes in the SF direction is a fraction of that comes from the IF direction. Now, that's a very underlying principle in all these uh, scattering and absorption, that it has to be a, a fraction of the incoming radiation. So it's a fraction of the irradiance coming into it. But this, remember, is a function which has got i and s both. That means gamma is uniquely defined for a pair of i and s. In other words, the gamma, if, it, if you're looking at it, as a function. Suppose you're looking at it as a function. It's a function of i and s. That means for every uh, for every uh, scattering angle, for every scattering angle, what is the scattering angle? It is the relationship between i and s. That's the scattering angle, isn't it? So for every scattering angle, you would have a certain fraction of radiation going in that direction. And that fraction is gamma. That fraction is gamma. You can write it in a discrete form by discretizing this geometry. That means uh, n number of IA directions and n number of SS directions. You can discretize and then this becomes a matrix and gamma becomes a matrix. Or you can write it as a function of both I and S if you know their functional forms. Now, to derive their functional forms is the uh, basic aspect of scattering theory. But it is 
extremely complicated because you have to go into the electromagnetics of this and uh, we will discuss it, but we will not derive it at all. Right, so we have a matrix here for discrete cases, I'm calling it a matrix, or we have a function here, which tells you the fraction of energy that comes in and that goes out after scattering, okay? And it is proportional to the scattering volume also. Now, uh, having said that, it's very easy to define the units. It's very easy to now define the units. Let me just push these away from me. It's now very easy to define the units and we call it volume scattering coefficient. If you remember, we had the same term used for absorption coefficient, volume absorption coefficient. We have used that there. And now with the same dimensions, we uh, define this new term, volume scattering coefficient. And what is the volume scattering coefficient? It is an integral of gamma. Okay, this function gamma, which tells you for a given i and given s, what is the fraction of energy that is scattered <coughs> multiplied by the scattering angle, multiplied by the solid angle in the scattering direction and integrated for all directions of scattering. So the scattering can happen in all four pi uh, uh, directions. So you have to integrate it from zero to four pi. Uh, remember that directions in solid geometry uh, are given in terms of 4, uh, four pi uh, when the integral is that around a sphere. We have done this earlier also. And therefore, 4 pi radians define the entire set of directions in which the scattering can go. And therefore, we need to integrate it in all possible scattering directions. This product, uh, this integral uh, tells you the property of the medium. The gamma tells you about the property of the scattering particle. Okay, the gamma tells you about the property of the scattering particle. Whereas this integral will tell you the property of the scattering medium. It's called the volume scattering coefficient. And so because you have divided it with dv, when you take i and divide it by f, Per unit dv, you get gamma. That's that's the difference. So per unit volume, per unit volume of this, the, the amount that is scattered in all directions is given by beta. So called the volume scattering coefficient. Uh, some microphones are on. Would you like to ask questions, please? Uh, all right. All right. I presume. Okay, uh, why I'm stressing this so much over here is that this property of the medium is uh, in analogy to the beta that we have expressed for absorption. Only in this case, there was a constant in the case of absorption, and here there is no constant. Here there is a function which depends upon the pair of i and s. All right. And now the next step is to write the Beer's law for scattering. This is the next step to use the Beer's law for scattering where beta into rho into ds. Okay. Now, beta would obviously have to be multiplied with local density as we had discussed earlier in the case of absorption. And 0 to L. Now, you come to a term where in the Beer's law, you use either absorption k, that is k, or you use beta, or you use the sum total of these two. One single equation can accommodate them. Okay, One single equation can accommodate them. And that's why this Beer's law, as I said, is a very general law. It can work for absorption. It can work for scattering. It can work for attenuation. So absorption is one term. Scattering is another term. The sum total of these two is called attenuation. And that is where the Earth's energy budget uh, is related to, attenuation, right. Now, there are mathematical tricks and jugglery, you see. Uh, why do you want to bring in a dimension quantity? This has a dimension, isn't it? Per meter per steradium. This is the definition of uh, beta. Uh, instead of that, 
we can use a dimensionless quantity and call it the phase function. Okay, it's a dimensionless quantity, a phase function, which is nothing but expressing gamma. Gamma is a fraction of energy diverted in a particular direction. Isn't it? Gamma is a specific amount of energy uh, diverted by scattering in a particular direction. That direction being WS is incidental. Now, for each of that direction WS, if you divide it by the total scattering, so it becomes a fraction scattered in a direction S as a function of the total scattering, the ratio of these two. Uh, and it becomes a dimensionless quantity. And these numbers are no longer unwieldy. They are between 0 and 1 and so on and so forth. And uh, 4 pi is the normalizing uh, factor. And this phase function is often used instead of gamma. In this integration that you have seen on the left-hand side, quite often phase function, in fact, almost always phase function is used in a normalized form of this equation. That is uh, something uh, why I said that is you will encounter the word phase function in uh, literature. Okay, now quickly recap this. I'm sure I need, need not do this much for you. You would have the definitions of uh, these. Please re recap them once again. Solid angles being defined by theta and phi. And uh, the definition of uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional angles. Uh, theta is equal to this L by R and omega is equal to A by R square. This is the definition of the solid angle. This is the definition of the, uh, of the normal two-dimensional angle. And the solid angle drawn over here with respect to the radiation geometry, uh, D omega, this can be split into uh, polar coordinate terms. That is sine theta is the vertical angle and phi is the azimuthal angle. This is easy to ge easily geometrically provable. But please recall this. We have already done this. <clears throat> now, we are coming to a slightly more complicated thing. Um, in terms of scattering, when you, when you talk about scattering, we obviously talk about the scattering of an electromagnetic wave. Now, uh, when you treat it as an electromagnetic wave, what does it uh, interact with? Uh, how is it different from uh, how is it different from the from the absorption? The molecules they absorb. Uh, the scattering can also be by molecules, but where is the difference? <laughs> uh, there are terms that you have come across: the elastic and the inelastic. In scattering also, you have elastic scattering and you have inelastic scattering. Elastic scattering is the incoming and the outgoing energies are conserved. Okay, That is treated by me scattering, a scattering theory called me scattering. And uh, if it is not conserved, that means entering radiation is not the same in terms of energy as the uh, um, outgoing radiation or the emitted radiation, we have a scattering theory which is non-elastic, non-elastic scattering theory. And that is generally termed under the term of, uh, under the head of uh, Raman scattering. So uh, scattering is usually treated by two approaches. One is an elastic scattering, which is treated as a me scattering, M-I-E is the word, and the non-elastic being the Raman scattering. Now, having said that, uh, where is the difference? We uh, look at the radiation itself. Now, see, look at this term. will tell you so many things. A wave, electromagnetic wave, is nothing but suppose uh, the, the, the electrical field. Okay, That's the electrical field maximum with time or in space along the motion of the wave into an oscillatory function. Okay, a wave is an oscillatory function in both space, R that is space, as well as in time. So if you stand at one place with a constant R, it will vary like an oscillator. If you uh, uh, take a snapshot with a constant T, you will get a wave picture through the first term. 
Okay, you'll get a wave picture through the first term. So whereas the traveling wave is a combination of both. So this is very important for you to understand that K is the wave number. Okay, K is the wave number that is inverse of wavelength. And uh, omega is the frequency, is the inverse of the uh, time period of oscillation. Okay, is the frequency. Uh, these two notions are built into uh, this equation, which says about, which talks about a traveling wave. Now, uh, it's also another, uh, if you look into the theory, this term that is over here, e to the power i something, is uh, related to the refractive index of the medium. How the refractive index changes the wave number or how it changes the frequency, that is therefore built into this uh, notion, physical quantity called a refractive index. Okay, now if, if that refractive index, that means the term within this bracket is negative. Suppose this is negative e to the power minus i square, okay, what will it be? Uh, e to the power minus i square will be what? e to the power minus i square uh, is one term or e to the power minus i square. One of them will be positive and the other will be negative. Suppose this is an imaginary quantity, no? Suppose this bracketed term is an imaginary quantity. It has a real part, it has an imaginary part. The imaginary part will give it i square term. The imaginary part will give it i squared term. So this i squared term is uh, e to the power minus something it will become, right? So it, in other words, means that it is attenuating, okay? That the electromagnetic wave is being damped as it is moving further. So that is called absorption. So what we have is, if the refractive index happens to be imaginary. The imaginary part of the refractive index, so to say, contributes to attenuation of radiation through uh, absorption. Whereas the real part will be an oscillatory function, a normal oscillatory function. It is about I something. So that will be the pure scattering case. Okay, That will be the pure scattering case, which is the uh, elastic part of it. Now, the elastic part of it, therefore, comes from the refractive index, which is real. And the non-elastic part of it comes from the refractive index, which is imaginary. So a simple look at this particular term tells you that elastic scattering, which is called pure scattering, uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the imaginary part of the, uh, sorry, and the absorption part of it, are related to a term called refractive index, which can be real as well as imaginary. Right. That is one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is this electromagnetic wave. Uh, it's easy to consider a polarized wave because in one plane, the E oscillations will take place, the electrical field. It is also true for the magnetic field, B. And the E and B would be related through by the uh, Maxwell's equations. So uh, both the terms will have to be explicitly given. I've just taken an example of the electric field oscillation. Now this electric field interacts with matter. When it interacts with matter, what is matter? After all, a matter can be a dipole with a positive and a negative charge separation. Some molecules are, some, um, uh, some of the um, uh, particles that are, they can be a dipole or they can be more complex, a multipole. So you can have multipole interactions as well as dipole interactions. Now they are just nothing but uh, ways of looking at it. A simplified way of looking at it is to consider it as a dipole. And in certain cases when it helps uh, to presume that it is a dipole, in many cases it is because the other multipoles at the quadrupole, uh, they, they are very weak. They don't uh, contribute much. Uh, so that is the, the number of uh, polarities that you go is related to this N that is defined here. Okay. Now, don't look at this straight away. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about this multipole interaction and dipole interaction. 
obviously the dipole interactions will be uh, how the electromagnetic force interacts with polarization uh, this the kind of reaction that the molecule will generate depend upon the polariz polarizability of the molecule which is again related to the refractive index so the refractive index the polarizability are all linked up okay when you talk of plane wave theory we usually stop at uh, defining the refractive index but when you are talking about interactions we usually talk about the polarization capa capacity of the medium so uh, when you talk of the um, uh, dipole it's obviously much much simpler than the multipole now look at this now these are cross sections what is a cross section we have done this beta is a cross section we have done that uh, we have also done beta for scattering we have done beta for absorption and we have also talked about the beta for extinction which is absorption plus scattering now uh, when in the case of multipole interactions this beta looks very very complicated okay uh, k is the wave number a, a, a is related to the size of the scattering particle a is related to the size of the scattering particle it always varies to inversely to the square of it and this is the wave number okay inverse of it will be the wave length and this an and bn this whole thing is compressed into a very simple looking thing but both an and bn are coefficients of uh, infinite series okay when you take dipole interactions you encounter uh, how do you define the uh, the phenomena of scattering it can be done by solving the electromagnetic equations uh, through the medium okay when you solve the interaction through the, uh, through the medium you come across legendre polynomials and bessel polynomials so these are functions that are in finite series you can truncate them at any value of n that means the number of multipoles that you consider can be limited uh, considering that the higher multipoles they hardly contribute uh, it's up to you but the generalized theory will have n going up to infinity all right so these are the coefficients that give this so obviously you will see that the, the the scattering cross sections or the extinction cross sections uh, this q is cross section now for the time being i have not used the term beta because q and beta are slightly different in terms of dimensions now uh, that is given by this uh, a long series of polynomials okay which come from solution of the electromagnetic equation when it is interacting with multipoles that's all and n being the uh, order of the multipole that you are considering this is something which is bringing in the complexity whenever you talk of scattering okay uh, we must thank ourselves that when we talk of dipole <coughs> when n is equal to 1 the things become much much more simpler when we talk of very small particles it means a is very small we can make this a n and b n even more simpler and you will see that these simple terms are uh, brought to use in a day to day uh, description of the atmosphere i am still keeping it a bit of a mystery not telling you right away in my next slide i'll reveal it okay, uh, okay. i'm taking a little time because my screen is you know jumbled with so many small screens right now uh, there is this term qe minus qs is obviously the cross section of absorption we realize this and we uh, also bring in this notion that the cross section that is the energy per unit volume okay that is being scattered Uh, and that is being extinguished this ratio of scattering to um, extinction this is given a special name all aerosol scientists know about this and all modelers they are always asking you can you please tell us the value of the ssa of this aerosol medium ssa is the single scattering albedo now it tells you uh, obviously through this equation QE minus QS is equal to QA. So, uh, if you divide this by QE on either side, 
uh, you can define this. Or if you say that the Q um, scattering uh, is equal to QE minus QA, uh, sorry, the scattering is equal to QE minus QA, you can use in any form uh, simultaneously with these two equations. You can use it. Now, what does it say is important? It says that when QS is zero, that means there is no scattering. There's only absorption. So SSA is also zero. Okay, the SSA single scattering albedo in the absence of scattering will be zero. Well, that's, that never happens, but then uh, that's, that's a hypothetical uh, thing to understand the range of values of SSA. And when there is no absorption, then QS is equal to QE. Okay, QS is equal to QE when this is zero, and therefore this is equal to one. So SSA can possibly take the value range of zero to one. And when it is one, it is pure scattering and no absorption. And when it is zero, it is pure absorption and no scattering. Now, this is something which is very important. And this comes from the ratio of these. These comes from the solution of the electromagnetic wave in, uh, equation interacting with the multipoles. So this is the whole story. When you start with the wave equation, you let it interact with the multipoles, you derive the cross sections or the energy per unit volume that is scattered, that is extinguished. And from there, you define the simple term, single scattering albedo to designate an aerosol whether it is an absorbing aerosol or whether it is a scattering aerosol. Clear? An absorbing aerosol in real life comes from uh, black carbon. Uh, a lot of burning of uh, fossil fuel or forest fires where carbon is released, unburnt carbon is released into the atmosphere. They are the absorbing ones. And the, and the SSA that uh, is usually encountered for these highly absorbing aerosols is only 0.7. Rarely does the SSA go below that unless there is a very dense plume of smoke. Very, very dense plume of smoke. So 0.7 for all practical purposes is the lower range of SSA that we encounter. And usually the values remain at 0 0.9, 0 0.98, 0 0.97. So absorption is minimal to the extent of only 2 to 3%. Okay. The highest absorbing will have a SSA of 0.7 and the lowest absorbing encountered in nature would have about uh, 0.98, so to say. Now, having said that, um, sorry, let me come to this. One approximation is that Rayleigh approximation. Now, in this Rayleigh approximation, there are two things. One is it, it is a dipole. First thing, it is a dipole. The second thing is the, these are spherical uh, scatterers, okay? We have not solved the problem for non-spherical scatterers. Uh, these are only spherical scatterers. So as the electromagnetic wave encounters a spherical particle, that is how it scatters. That has been the presumption in our derivations. Now, uh, uh, another presumption that you make is the size of the particles smaller than the wavelength. Well, the molecules of the atmosphere are genuinely smaller than the wavelength. In that case, the intensity of radiation that is scattered as a function of intensity of radiation coming from the sun is given by this formula. Okay, this is far more simple than the mean scattering formula. Okay, and this has a dependence on theta. Theta is a scattering angle. That's what I told you. One plus cos square theta is a function, and cos square theta can be maximum one. So this value can be, uh, this numerator can be two, and then when this is zero, this can be one. Okay. So from the minimum to the maximum, the scattered radiation in different directions can go from one unit to double that unit. And that is exactly what you see here. Okay, The amount of radiation scattered in this direction, that this is a direction in which light is coming. Okay, And, and the amount of uh, radiation scattered in this direction, this and the one that is going forward, one is to two. That is what this equation tells. And theta is equal to zero or two pi. This is equal to um, um, 1 upon 2 r square, otherwise it is a 2 upon 2 r square. That's all. Now, uh, this the other important thing is lambda to the power 4, min, uh, minus 4. This is the usual thing that we uh, uh, highlight 
about Rayleigh scattering. It says that for longer wavelength, the scattering is less. So the light coming to your eyes is what is being scattered, isn't it? The observer is sitting and standing here. So the light coming to your eyes usually scattered from the scatterer somewhere in the sky. Okay. Be it a molecule, be it a particle, is in uh, immaterial. The sun is giving light and it is scattered into your direction. And what you see is lambda to the power four, uh, sorry, lambda to the power minus four. What it means is the, uh, the, the blue wavelengths will be scattered much more. So you're looking at the scattered light. So the sky will appear to you blue. And when uh, you have uh, red light, uh, or the red end of the spectrum, you have much less scattering. That's all. But but the distance factor R, this is the distance factor R between yourself and the scatterer. Okay? Between when the sun is very low, this distance is very high. R is very high. And therefore, the role of R is to change the color of the sky. That's why morning uh, sky color is different from the daytime sky color. Is that clear to you? Right. Now, the other terms here are the refractive indices, the nature of which we are not discussing right now. The size of the particle and these size of the particles, when they are very, very small, we can neglect this term. We can hardly bother about it. Instead of refractive index, you can talk about alpha, the polarizability. And you can also talk about the number of particles. Okay. Instead of refractive index of the medium, you can talk about the number of particles as well as the polarizability alpha. The rest of the equation remains the same. Now, this is known as the Rayleigh scattering approximate. And what it says is that normal condi conditions, the blue light is scattered towards the observer more than the red light, and that's why the sky is blue. But the color of the sky is, is altered by the role of the distance being played in here. So it looks a little more reddish when this distance is very high. I mean, when the sun is lower in the horizon. Okay. Now, I think we should be coming towards the end of this lecture. Uh, we summarized this, just now what I said, the lambda dependence, the R dependence, and the theta dependence. The theta dependence clearly tells you if you are looking at it in the forward direction. That means the light is scattered to you from the horizon. The sun is on the horizon, and you are standing and watching the sun, so the theta here is zero. But when in the daytime, when the sun is, uh, uh, is causing a 90 degree angle with respect to the observer, this scattering is much less. Okay? And therefore, the mornings and the evenings tend to look a little more hazy when there is more scattered light. Okay? And in the noon, it, it, it looks a little less hazy. All right. Now, these are something that you glean from that equation. The important thing is what is the difference in the generalized me scattering? In the generalized me scattering is when the scattering particle is not really small, not molecules of the atmosphere, when they are solid particles or liquid particles, like in the case of the real atmosphere. The scattering function changes. You have talked about the scattering function. They, that changes drastically. And you have looked at the scattering function of Rayleigh on the left-hand side which says in the forward direction and the backward direction, the scattering is maximum. In the perpendicular direction, the scattering is low. One plus cos squared theta was the term, right? Now, as I told you, the scattering cross-section is highly complicated when you take into, other, uh, take, take into account the number of multipole interactions. Or when the size of the particle is larger. Or when there is a size distribution of particles in the atmosphere. You can still work it out. What it says is the backward scattering is less, the forward scattering is much more. The larger the particles, this ratio increases. You are now interested in integrating. Take a half plane over here. Take a half plane over here. To the left hand side is what is back scatter. To the right hand side, what is forward scatter? And you know the angular dependence. So you can integrate it with respect to this angular dependence on both the forward direction as well as the backward direction. And what you get is an asymmetry in the scattered radiation. This is symmetric. Remember that. Rayleigh scattering is symmetric on either side. Whereas the mean scattering is asymmetric. And the asymmetry grows and the particles become larger. And so we can summarize this inf information. that neither Rayleigh nor mean scatterings are isotropic. 
Please remember that. There is a theta dependence in different directions. It is different. So the moment you talk about scattering, forget about isotropy. It's only there up to absorption. Uh, then that also absorption, um, uh, one sec, sorry, in a dense medium, not, no, not in a very rarefied medium. So uh, it's an ideal isotropy, none of them. The dominance of forward scattering in the me scattering situation, okay, dominance of forward scattering, it brings to, um, uh, it helps you to define an asymmetry function. And the asymmetry function depends upon the ratios of the forward and backward irradiance. The moment you integrate it with respect to angle, radians become irradiance. Remember that. <laughs> so the three parameters combined. What are the three parameters? Phase function. What is the phase function? This, the angular dependence. What is the asymmetry function? That take a half plane, what is happening on the right-hand side and what is happening on the left-hand side. And the single scattering albedo. How much is being absorbed and how much is being scattered are the three main properties of the aerosol that the modeler should know to find out the energy budget. Okay? And therefore, uh, that brings us to the end of this lecture where we have made so many simplifications. One of them is, look at the axis. Okay? Look at the axis. And suppose you are looking at this axis from the end. You can rotate this axis. <laughs> In other words, this direction can form a volume if you, if you rotate it. If it is a spherical scatterer, it is symmetric with respect to rotation. Remember that. So if you are presuming it's a uh, scattering is from a spherical particle, this will be axis symmetric. This diagram will be axis symmetric. Okay. You rotate the axis, the left to right is the x-axis. You rotate it around the about the x-axis, and you'll get the same function in all the azimuthal planes. <coughs> the same is true for me scattering. The same is true for the larger particle scattering. But all particles are not spherical. The next stage of complexity comes from non-spherical particles. And there, this axis symmetry cannot be guaranteed. Okay, When an electromagnetic wave hits a spherical particle, it behaves in a symmetric manner. But when it behaves an irregular particle, it will not. And therefore, whenever you do this angular integration for finding out the fluxes, uh, you will run into serious trouble if it is not a spherical particle. That's all. Okay. <coughs> Maybe I uh, end this lecture here today, uh, highlighting the isotropic situation of absorption and the anisotropic situation of scattering and how in a common equation, we can accommodate both absorption and scattering. All right. All right. I think I come to an end of this lecture. Thank you very much. Patiently listening to it. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for your nice talk. And uh, I think I described about the scattering, different scattering concepts. Uh, now we will see what are the questions we have. Sir. There is only one question seems to be. Uh, question is, if the calculation of absorption, diffusion are shown in the Excel, it would be very easier for the having minimum math factor. Uh, can I have a question one sec? Because <clears throat> with transmitter and reflectance, both can be called as scattering. Uh, well, yes. Thank you for the information. If calculation of absorption diffusion are shown in Excel, it would be yes. very easier for those having minimum mathematical background. Uh, <clears throat> now, in Excel, I really don't understand what it is, but I give you a hint that uh, for non-mathematics um, kind of assimilation of this problem, we said that you break up the solid geometry into discrete uh, angles, okay? D omega S is no longer continuum. It is discrete. That means uh, you can use gamma as a matrix rather than as a function. That simplifies uh, integration to simply bringing in multiplication, okay? Integration can be replaced by normal multiplication. Uh, does it make sense? 
that is discretize the uh, scattering don't make it look like continuum the moment it is continuum it brings in mathematical functions which are difficult to integrate but if you look at it in a discrete sense that means in a few di directions if you consider <coughs> i'm sorry <coughs> that reduces the problem of integration to simple multiplication i can offer this kind of a simplification that's all could you elaborate more so on there is ah uh, please Yes, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, since I'm able to look at these questions, that's why I'm preempting them. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure, sure. You can. You can do that. But you're free to interpret these questions from your side. <laughs> yes, sir. The question is. Uh, uh, it is from Iyale uh, Tagenge. Uh, his question is: uh, Could you please elaborate more the specific difference between reflection and scattering in a more literal way? <clears throat> Uh, reflection is the backward scattering. <clears throat> Towards the end of the lecture, we brought in this notion of asymmetry, isn't it? <clears throat> that means in the forward direction is uh, from the scattering angle of plus pi by two to minus pi by two. Where if you integrate between plus pi by two and minus pi by two, you get the forward, and from minus uh, from minus pi by two to plus pi by two, you get the uh, the backward. Now this backward and uh, can be called as reflection. Uh, it, it refers to the albedo of the uh, of the medium. So scattering and reflection are related when it comes from scattering particles. When it comes from a solid surface, uh, it is treated differently. Okay. So when in the case of aerosols, scattering and reflection are related to the integral values in the forward direction and the backward direction. Uh, so they are again requesting the uh, reading materials. Okay, maybe you can give us so that we will uh, send it to the participants. Uh, okay. Source materials. Yes. I keep that in mind. Uh, at the end of this lecture, <laughs> find out. Yes. Sure. 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 Another question: uh, Is there any relation between the absorption and the non-sphericity of particles <laughs> in the atmosphere? Ah. Uh. Now, uh, we have talked about the non-sphericity uh, sphericity in the case of scattering. And we said that uh, the phase function that we drew, those hedgehog diagrams, so to say, uh, they are axis symmetric. You rotate the axis, they will look the same in all azimuthal plane. That is what I said. So uh, the moment the scattering particle is non-spherical, that goes. And uh, that is because the electromagnetic wave is hitting uh, a non-symmetric uh, scatterer. Uh, it's not a sphere anymore. So non-sphericity in case of scattering is pretty obvious. Now, in the case of absorption, since the size of the scatterer is so, so small, we talk of uh, absorption by the molecules. Absorption by uh, aerosols directly is not in question, uh, especially in short range. Uh, if you look at the infrared, yes, they will be. And that needs a more elaborate treatment. I have not gone into that treatment where the wavelength is in the infrared and even the scattering particle is in, in, uh, absorption is taken into account. Uh, so uh, I talk of short wave right now, make things simple. And there absorption uh, for non-spherical uh, particles is hardly of any consequence. The particles are so small, uh, the molecules, that... Uh, Looking from uh, a few angstroms away, a few hundred angstroms away, they will not look like uh, having a structure. Okay, so non-sphericity is not taken into account. But yes, the polarity is taken into definitely in absorption also. The polarity, especially when you talk of inelastic scattering, the Raman scattering, there, there definitely it is uh, important. Okay. I, I, that's, all, that's all the questions. Okay. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Now, before uh, going for a vote of thanks, I request all the panelists to turn on their video uh, so that we can have a photograph. <clears throat> okay, thank you, sir. Mohan, Thank you uh, can you deliver a vote of thanks?
Mohan? Yeah, okay, okay, sure. Uh, just a minute, please. Maybe uh, there is some some sound issue. So, okay, just. <laughs> Is, is the slide visible? Ah uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Keep it, keep in full screen. Uh, now. Uh, guess, uh, is Tim Richards persons and member of the coordination committee and dear participants. I extend the expression and gratitude for the addition of two days in session on especially in relation with the moles and particles. This is the object of this. We'd like to start to our esteemed speaker, Dr. B. Mukho, former a meteorologist. Yeah, I think there is an issue, sir, with his uh, internet. Okay, let us uh, wind up. Uh, sure. So, yeah, yeah. So I thank uh, on behalf of Sama and uh, Saram ISP, uh, I thank uh, uh, the speaker, uh, Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. B. Mukhopadhyay uh, for delivering the excellent lecture on the scattering concepts. Uh, thank you very much, sir. So I also thank the other panelists of Sama and SRM. And I uh, especially thank, profusely thank the participants for their time and, uh, you know, for your patient hearing. And thank you very much. So next week we'll be meeting as usual on next Saturday. Suddenly in an activity. Uh, yeah. Next Saturday at uh, 3 p.m. We are going to have a very, very interesting lecture on next week. Uh, it is on the radio. Uh, okay. uh, I am okay. confident that your presentation has provided us and has inspired us to participate. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah. Next week, we'll have a lecture on radiative transfer, which is a very, very important topic. Mm -hmm. I request all the participants to attend the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you once yeah. again. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. So I pull out now. Thank you. Yes. So, Lakshmiji, can you leave now, right? No, no, Mohan, uh, how to how to stop to... how to uh, stop live? I am in mobile actually. Uh, you are the host, so I think you in the top. Uh... I am unable to see it from the mobile. Uh, stop. I think right. I think if oh, I enter, if I end the session, case... if I end the session, I think a live all. Uh, I... And now maybe sometimes it is a create problem or you just make me host i can i can check ah yes yes one second yes you can do now